Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be showing you what patterns exist in different properties of elements on the periodic table. Remember that the periodic table was set up so that elements near each other, especially within the same column, have similar reactivities. And then there are other patterns as well that we'll see across rows, across periods, and other patterns aside from reactivity that we'll look at going down a column or down a group. The first trend that we're going to look at is called atomic radius. An atomic radius, if you think about an atom as a sphere, the radius would be half of the distance of its diameter of a neutral atom that's in ground state. Really, you can think of atomic radius as just being relative size of atoms if they are smaller or larger. The trend that we see going from left to right within the same period is that the largest atoms are on the left side and they get gradually smaller as you move to the right. It's a little bit counterintuitive because the number of protons increases, but the number of protons doesn't determine the size of the atom. It's really how big their electron shells or where their electrons are orbiting is. And so as you add more protons from left to right, the electron orbitals are pulled in tighter and tighter. Remember, because the protons in the middle of the nucleus are positively charged, and the electrons that are orbiting outside are negatively charged. And so with more protons in the nucleus, each time you add one, it kind of brings those electrons in closer and closer. And so from sodium to magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon. Sodium is the largest in this period, in this row, and argon is the smallest. The trend going down a column, or down a group, down a family, is that the smallest atoms are at the top, and they get larger and larger as we move down. The reasoning is that with each extra row on the periodic table, you're adding a principal energy level. Or if you're thinking back to Bohr models, you're adding another Bohr shell for electrons to exist within. And so skipping down from number three to number 11 means that we are going from three electrons to 11 electrons when these are neutral. And that huge jump in electrons means that you need a whole other principal energy level. So the trend is, again, from hydrogen to francium, Hydrogen is the smallest, and they get gradually larger. From beryllium to radium, beryllium is the smallest, and they get gradually larger. Now when you put both of those trends together for atomic radius, or size of atoms, you would see that they get larger as you go this way, and they get larger as you go this way. And so that means the largest atoms are here, and the smallest are in the opposite corner the smallest atom being helium. Next, we'll look at valence electrons and electron configuration. And this is when referring to neutral atoms of the element. Moving across a row, each time you add a proton, for that element to be neutral, you're also adding an electron. And so, in the same row, each time you move one space over, you're increasing not only the number of protons in the nucleus, but the number of outer or valence electrons. And so these all have one valence electron. These all have two. These have three, four, five, six, seven. And aside from helium, eight. Remember that for some trends or patterns of the periodic table, it's best to think of helium not being here, but being here in the S block. The trend that you see going down a column or down a group is that all of the elements in a family or in a group or in a column all have the same number of valence electrons and therefore have the same electron configuration or a similar electron configuration. So the 
final part of the electron configuration for lithium is 2s1 for sodium, it's 3s1, 4s1, 5s1, 6s1, and 7s1. So they all have the same valence electron configuration of s1. These are all s2. These are all p1, p2, p3, p4, p5, and starting with neon, p6. Helium, again, fits better here because it ends in 1s2. Next is first ionization energy. And what that means is that if you've got your atom with all of its electrons spinning around and orbiting and it's neutral, first ionization energy is how much it, energy it takes to pull one of those electrons away. It shrinks the atom a little bit, but it's how much energy it takes to pull that first electron away, first ionization energy. There is something called second ionization energy, which is how much it takes to pull the second electron away. We will not go into that, but first ionization energy is the trend that we're looking at. For first ionization energy, within a row, within a period, it's lowest on the left, and then gets higher and gradually higher as you move to the right. And so in this second row, in this second period, lithium would have the lowest first ionization energy, and neon would have the highest. It is hardest to pull an electron off of neon, then it's also hard, but not hardest to pull an electron off of fluorine, and it's easiest to pull an electron off of lithium. The reason for that is similar to the reasoning for the atomic radius, is that as you move this way, you've got more protons, more positively charged protons in the nucleus, and so those positively charged protons are going to hold on to the electrons better. Not only that, but as they get smaller, the negatively charged electrons will be closer to the nucleus and therefore held more tightly. going down a column, going down a group or family on the periodic table. Remember that we add, if we're thinking about Bohr model, we're adding shells, and so those electrons are going to be further and further and further away. And so because the electrons are further away from the nucleus, which is holding them in place, they will be more easily lost and have a lower first ionization energy. It will be easier to pull them off. So between lithium, sodium, potassium, potassium would have the lowest first ionization energy, and lithium would have the highest of those three. They get gradually lower, and so if you put those two patterns together, the ones with the lowest first ionization energy are here, and the elements with the highest first ionization energy are up here. It is harder to pull electrons off of these atoms, and easiest to pull electrons off of these. Notice what types of elements these are, that these, the ones that it's hardest to pull electrons from, are the non-metals. It is hard to pull electrons off of those. It is easy to pull electrons off of these, the most reactive metals. A similar concept is called electronegativity. Electronegativity is how strong an atom pulls electrons into itself when it's in a bond with something. And it follows pretty much the same pattern as ionization energy for the same reasons, where within a row, the electronegativity gets greater as you move to the right. And so this has the lowest electronegativity in this row, and this has the highest. The difference is that the noble gases have virtually zero electronegativity. They actually aren't even counted in this trend because these do not bond or react with other elements and therefore don't pull electrons to themselves. And so while first ionization energy trends do count the noble gases, electronegativity does not. So you're increasing until this point. Similar to ionization energy, the electronegativity is decreasing as you go down so that these will pull electrons to themselves least and higher up, have higher electronegativity and pull electrons to themselves even more. Therefore, for electronegativity, if you're putting both of those patterns together, 
that it's lower this way and lower this way. The lowest electronegativities would be in this corner. And the highest electronegativity of all elements is fluorine. And then the elements near it. The last trend we're going to cover is reactivity. And reactivity is different for metals and nonmetals. It is how stable they are in their neutral form and how likely they are to react with other elements. The pattern is opposite for metals and nonmetals. The most reactive metals, now recall that metals lose electrons in reactions. And so the metals that lose electrons the easiest or that hold their electrons the least are therefore going to be the most reactive. So with low ionization energy, low electronegativity, that means that those metals are reactive. And so the most reactive metals are here. They're more reactive as you move this way and as you go down. So the most reactive metals are down in this corner. These are all very reactive metals. These are all fairly reactive metals. But again, as you go further, they get more reactive going down. And as you compare this to this, this is the more reactive column. For nonmetals, the opposite is true. Nonmetals gain electrons in reactions, and so that means they have a high electronegativity. Electronegativity means how much they pull electrons to themselves, and so in reactions that a nonmetal pulls electrons to itself, having a high electronegativity means that it is highly reactive. And therefore, reactivity for nonmetals follows the same pattern as electronegativity, where the most reactive nonmetals are the ones that are the highest electronegativity values. Fluorine is the most reactive nonmetal, followed by oxygen and chlorine. So these gases, fluorine and chlorine, if you breathe them in, they are so reactive that they would degrade and react with the uh, substances that make up the lining of your lungs. Oxygen, also quite reactive, but we need it to live. And does, over time, because it is so reactive, cause things that are called free radicals um, and damage to DNA. So those are the main trends within the periodic table. So you should be able to pick an element and determine, based on its placement, is it going to have a higher or lower electronegativity than those around it? Is it going to have a higher or lower ionization energy compared to those around it? Is its atomic radius going to be higher or lower than those around it? So for example, if we pick sulfur, with sulfur here, we know that it has a larger radius than chlorine, but a smaller radius than phosphorus. We know that it has a larger radius than oxygen, but that it's smaller than selenium. A single atom of sulfur is smaller than a single atom of selenium because of this placement. For sulfur's electronegativity, remember, since fluorine is the most electronegative, we would say that sulfur probably has a lower electronegativity than fluorine, but higher than phosphorus. It probably has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, but a higher electronegativity or pull on electrons compared to selenium. So again, you're going to be expected to pull an element from the S block or from the P block and compare it to those above and below it, as well as to the left and to the right in terms of those trends and explain why it fits those patterns.